we'll move now then to the last panel of today, but it's on the topic that has come up as a thread, if you like, through many of our other discussions, and that is the thorny issue of enforcement. So please, could my panelists please make their way up onto the stage? Ladies first. That's dangerous. <laughs> so, thank you very much for joining us. We're mixing things up a little bit. I'm going to sit and direct my questions at all of you, laser-like focus, even though it's late in the day. So I hope everyone here is shaking themselves up and ready for a good, angry argument about enforcement and why it works and when it doesn't. Um, with that, let me introduce you to our speakers. Beside me, coming from DG Competition in the European Commission, is Alberto Paciega, who is the Director for Information, Telecommunications and Media within DG Comp. Um, then we have, of course, Ursula Pacht, who is the Director, Dep Deputy Director General of Bayerk. Thank you very much. Next, we have Alexandra Destriel, a Professor at Namur University, Academic Dire Director at CER and Chair of the EU Expert Group on the Platform Economy. Uh, then Dries Kuypers is coordinator for the digital economy for the consumer division of the Authority for Consumers and Markets in the Netherlands. That's quite a mouthful, thank you very much. And last but not least, joining us from the European Data Protection Board, we have Deputy Chair Venislav Karadjov. Alberto, I'm going to start with you. Um, what are your thoughts on the challenges in digital markets, in particular in effective enforcement? It's a very different world to the offline world. So tell me a bit how you view it, how the Commission views it. There have been some lessons learned, I think, or not learned in recent years from the GDPR. Tell us a bit about what you see going forward. Okay. Thank you very much. I will talk um, mostly about what um, relates to my job, which is uh, competition enforcement. And um, so uh, the first question is perhaps, are digital markets completely different from the other sectors of the economy when it comes to ensuring fair competition? And the answer is yes and no. Um, no, because the phenomena we see in digital markets are not unknown to us. Yes, because the scale of these phenomena are unprecedented. And I'd like to mention three very quickly. Uh, the first is probably the one that needs least uh, comment is the importance of data in the digital economy. I think much of the day has been uh, dedicated to that, but we have, and the, the, the previous intervention actually told us how crucial and necessary data is to the digital economy. Um, the second is um, more economic, is what we call network effects. Uh, it means that the importance of a specific service directly depends on how many people use it, and these are self reinforcing mechanisms. And the, the easiest is, you know, the usual example, we, I use WhatsApp because you use WhatsApp. And since we all do, everybody has to use WhatsApp. And if I wanted to move to another messaging services, I would have to convince so many people to move with me that basically I cannot get out. The third phenomenon, um, it's um, uh, very huge, huge economies of scale, um, which in uh, very simple words, it, it means that the cost of building a service may be very high, but the cost of serving 1 million, 10 million, or 1 billion customers is not incrementally so high. So what is the, the effects of all these? Is that, that there is a, a clear tendency to basically have one provider, one supplier. That is in the mechanics of the system. And in our jargon, we call it uh, high uh, barriers to entry, or consumer lock-in. And basically, that means it's very, very difficult to challenge the incumbents. And that's what we see in a, in a number of realms. Our job is to actually allow this challenge and allow um, new uh, challengers to come into the market and to bring new services to, uh, to the people. So nothing is new, but the scale is very new. And, and that is why 
even though the European Commission has been at the forefront of intervention into the digital markets, um, uh, taking antitrust cases for the last 20 years when there was very, very little acceptance around the world that this was necessary, um, still we face in a situation that um, the usual um, way of enforcement, which is to look at what's happening in the market, see somebody's deviating from fair competition, assessing the situation, sanctioning the companies and changing the course has proved no longer, uh, is no longer sufficient. Because um, it, it's a still a very powerful instrument, but it's um, most powerful against individual misbehavior. And here we have a systemic issue. And that is the very reason why the, um, Europe has, uh, has given itself the Digital Markets Act that was also uh, just mentioned. What is behind the Digital, digital market, uh, Markets Act? Simply the recognition that it's not a matter of sanctioning individual misbehavior, but it's a matter of reshaping the structure of the market. So we, we cannot only do post, ex post intervention, that we will still do, but we need ex ante regulation. Again, this is very new for the sector, it's not new for the economy, there is plenty of regulated sectors, electricity, telecoms have undergone the same, finance is regulated, uh, medicines are heavily regulated, so it's nothing new, but it's a, it's a real earthquake for the digital sector. Again, um, we are the first in the world to this scale, it's a huge challenge, and, uh, but you know, we are gearing up for it. The Digital Markets Act will enter into, um, into force soon, it's, uh, very soon it will actually enter into force, it will start biting uh, next year. So we hope that as of, let's say, 2024, uh, we will all see the practical um, effects of the Digital Markets Act and that will be things like you being able to choose uh, which app store you want to use on your telephone. Now I guess you don't, you don't have a lot of choice. Um, not having um, digital giants pushing their own services, leveraging the power they have just to push their own services and actually shutting out uh, possible challengers. Or um, um, a more um, fair um, use of the data I mean, we, personal data is not really our, uh, there will be very qualified speakers to that, but the huge amount of data that the digital gatekeepers uh, gather not only from individuals, but also from other, other businesses, and there are businesses that, that have no alternative than going through the gatekeepers, because that's basically the only way to reach consumers, and it's fair that they also, uh, first of all, have the possibility to access their own data, which is not always the case, and also have the possibility to exploit it. So I, it's a real change in, uh, in approach and is a change I hope um, will be very visible very soon. Well, that's the DMA covered yeah. now. Dries, do we need a completely new enforcement architecture in Europe? <laughs> yes, thank you very much, Jennifer. And I think I alluded to it before, I'm a civil servant. And I think civil servants rarely advocate revolutions in this world, so um, I won't be any different from that perspective. But um, <clears throat> yeah, maybe, maybe to answer your question more in depth. Um, and before I do so, I actually also want to say, I'm going to address some challenges that we face as consumer enforcement agencies. Now, I think I can speak not just for the ACM in the Netherlands, but also for some others. Um, it may actually appear that you know, enforcement is in a pretty dire state, if you listen to me, uh, which I don't think is the case. Um, I just want to make that clear beforehand. Um, I think we, we actually are achieving um, uh, pretty well. Uh, and of course, there is things that we can improve specifically in relation to the developments that we see in digital markets. So that's really what I would like to address. And there's basically four points um, that I want to briefly look at. Um, the first one is that within this new area, with well, new, relatively new area, we really need um, multidisciplinary enforcement. So we used to work a lot with lawyers. We used to have a fair amount of people that understand economics, but we absolutely need people that um, understand the technology and also understand, or the psychologists that understand the human behavior that's involved. And I know that this is something which is being worked on 
in different, uh, many different agencies at the moment, including ours. So we do have a, a BI team. We do have what we call a data hub, which is a, a group of specialists and people that are specialized in data processing. Um, but I know this is um, relatively difficult in smaller agencies. So this is something to absolutely bear in mind. Additionally, and I think this was already alluded to by, by some previous speakers as well, is, you know, these, especially big tech has a lot of budget for R&D. Um, the innovations that we are confronted with um, are happening at a very high rate. And they're very often characteristic by, by complexity. Um, we're confronted with issues like A-B testing, AIs, we've spoken about that today, but for example, NFTs, loot boxes, developments in relations to, to AR and VR, in-app currencies, and the list is long. Um, and this requires a lot of quick understanding of what's happening. So this is a continuous challenge. I think it has always been a challenge to enforcement, um, is to keep up with the developments. Well, we'll never be you know, in front of them. Uh, we'll always be lagging a little bit behind, which I don't think is a problem as soon as the gap doesn't become too big. And lastly, I think we're also struggling, of course, because to get this expertise, we need to find people on the labor market. And there is a lot of parties out there that pay a lot more than most governments do. So uh, I think that's an additional challenge. Um, the second point that I want to address is the point of cooperation. So in this digital era, obviously, almost everything that's happening is cross-border. So um, we need to look at cooperation uh, within for example, the CPC network, where we're currently having this um, revision of the CPC regulation, and we're looking at things that need to be improved. And there is definitely some things that we can improve. Um, but it's not only that. So we also need to look at the way the different networks, for example, the ECN, but also the DPA network, cooperates with the CPC and how we tap into these cross-cutting issues um, across these different fields of law, because you know, in reality, there is no distinction in the practices that we see. Um, a probably even more challenging cooperation is the one internationally, so cross borders outside of the EU. Um, there is this long standing problem, of course, that bad actors tend to find those jurisdictions which are the least risk to them, and this is still, of course, happening. So, so we need to. Also, and there is work on going on this within ISPEN, within the OECD, there is the US-EU um, dialogue, so there is a lot happening, but it, it goes fairly slow, and you know, this is something that we need to address. And of course, I'll not go into that, there's of course the cooperation within every member state, where all the different authorities need to cooperate, and you know, as much as I like the improvements of the DSA, the DMA, but there is going to be new enforcement agencies to cooperate with, so the field is widening. Lastly, or thirdly, and I'm going to be pretty short about this because we've spoken about this extensively, but if you want to have effective enforcement, you need, first of all, proper legislation on the norms, right? So this is, has been debated this morning, I'm not going to repeat it, uh, but there are some fundamental discussions that we need to have in Europe around consumer protection, such as how do we deal with personalization, how do we deal with the average consumer, um, uh, how do we design fairness, uh, what do we think th th fairness is. And I think this needs to be also, um, um, uh, we also need to look at legal powers. So traditional powers of investigation don't always work effectively in the digital realm. And I think this is also something we need to visit. My final point, um, and this is pretty obvious, but I, I, I thought I'd mention it here anyway, is we need to sufficiently resource um, consumer, uh, or, or maybe even more broadly, uh, enforcement agencies. Um, this is obviously always a struggle within, you know, tight budgets, which most governments currently certainly have. Um, but I'll tell you why we need to do so, because first of all, Within the digital realm, consumers are less likely to report problems, either because they don't recognize them in the first place, um, or because they don't really 
see how things can be harmful. So we need to rely a lot more on intelligence gathering than we needed in the past in traditional sectors. Um, secondly, investigating the digital space requires capacities to investigate the digital domain, and they're not always out there, so we need to build them. This requires resources, but also, what I referred to at the start, the expertise to do so. Um, I'm very happy for that example, for example, that the EU has built this e-lab capacity. I'm not sure if you're aware of it, but it's a lab, a digital lab, um, which requires the tooling for all the European enforcement agencies to do investigations in the digital domain. So that's very important. I think we also need to bear in mind that you know, market incentives, and I think um, Emeritus Professor Zubo's presentation really went into that. There, the market, the digital market, has little incentive to comply. In, or maybe put it differently, the focus is definitely on the optimization of conversion. And we have been speaking to the digital uh, actors in the Netherlands over the last few years, and it, it turned out and it appears that generally their knowledge of consumer uh, legislation is rather low. So therefore also compliance bill will be rather low. So we're really up against um, a, uh, bringing about a massive change in the, in the sector. And that also, that's also requires um, uh, um, uh, sufficient resources. And I have to say that in the Netherlands, I think we're fairly well off uh, being quite well resourced. I know that there's some colleagues out there in Europe that are certainly uh, in a different position. So that's, um, I think, the final remark from my side. Well, that provides me with a nice segue into Wenceslav, because I know recently the EDPB and the EDPS put out a statement saying they were struggling for resources, including human resources. Uh, so, Wenceslav, tell us what you think the future of enforcement should be. What needs to change? Um, well, um, I'm coming from the practice, indeed, uh, uh, more than 10, 12 years um, working into this area, more practical lawyer uh, dealing with complaints, but also um, uh, on a management level. Um, now, listening to uh, the various experts here, I would say that uh, the consumers area uh, needs something like similar to what GDPR did in the privacy. Um, because otherwise we cannot have effective enforcement and protection of consumers' rights. Uh, um, what the GDPR did is, GDPR said that the enforcement bodies uh, are at the local level, and this is most effective for us as consumers and citizens, because we need fast advice, and we need as much as possible uh, free procedures, uh, to access to the uh, regulators, to the authorities, to protect our rights. Uh, because uh, as consumers, uh, we are the weak um, uh, party into the relationship with the business, uh, because the business uh, uh, possesses uh, the resources, uh, well-trained lawyers, and etc. cetera. Um, and what the GDPR also said that uh, these authorities, should develop the same culture. Because here in the previous uh, panels, uh, I also heard that um, we don't have the culture, or the culture is uh, uh, completely uh, different in some uh, uh, countries. Uh, and they don't have also the resources. But I think that the culture uh, can be easily developed for about three, four years of, uh, of uh, uh, its implementation. The, G the GDPR developed a significant enforcement culture into the uh, data protection authorities. And yes, uh, we also were lacking with resources and expertise uh, for enforcement, but slowly we're building up these resources. There were a lot of complaints and a lot of hesitation that the data protection authorities will fail, but it turns out that uh, um, most of these predictions are wrong. Uh, of course, we cannot uh, um, uh, continue if we don't have a, a body, which is the European Data Protection Board, that is responsible for the, um, uh, 
the, uh, not for the uh, compliant implementation itself, but for the consistency, for the right understanding of the various uh, uh, rules that are in the uh, law, and they are um, equally interpreted by the data protection authorities, and this way equally defending uh, the uh, data subject rights. This is the same in the, should be the same into the uh, consumer field. And in addition, when the data protection authorities um, does have different understandings, uh, they can go to the data protection board, uh, consider it a consumer body, uh, that will resolve these conflicts. This is the most effective way for enforcement. Uh, it proves to be uh, uh, with the GDPR. I was uh, a little bit reluctant in the beginning that it will happen because various countries, various uh, people and cultures, but it turns out that it can work. Even in the uh, cross-border cooperation, which was said here is very difficult uh, to happen, but it turns out that in the board we have 2,000 cases. 2,000 cases, and 300 of them already are resolved with uh, full cooperation, only five disagreements on a big tech companies, but recently we uh, uh, established as a board uh, um, uh, obligatory decision to one of the lead authorities, and for example, Instagram will be uh, sanctioned 400 and five million of euros. And yes, the uh, Shushana, the uh, American um, uh, professor um, that we were listening here uh, uh, was right that uh, we cannot uh, stop everybody doing wrong thing, but this is not the purpose of the regulators and of the enforcement, because we have the so-called general prevention in the law. Once you cut the problem, you, you, you uh, identify the problem and then uh, you show everybody what wrong has been done, and there is a significant sanction, which is immediate on time, then others, on the basic of the general prevention, will, uh, will think about whether they would like to do the same and get the same punishment and same treatment by the authorities, because it is um, a practice that is proven through the court and to the uh, uh, court decisions as well. And uh, this is more important, uh, I would say, for the enforcement, uh, to have a, a consistent understanding of the rules uh, and someone uh, at EU level to uh, observe this consistency, to resolve the disagreements, and to support uh, the uh, cooperation between the authorities. Because otherwise, to leave the cooperation to the authorities themselves it is very difficult because they lack of resources. And when a small authority is lacking resources, it does not want to uh, cooperate with others because it needs the resources for uh, its own um, daily purposes. And it becomes a problem for the management and for the uh, experts to deal with these uh, small resources. Well, Alexandra, I understand earlier this year you co-authored a, a SARA report that deals exactly, looks at comparing the different networks of enforcement in different sectors. Give us your perspective on this. Yeah, so um, thanks very much for the, for the invitation. I mean, um, the in-person confer in conference have an advantage that we can meet people, but also a drawback is that we are not used anymore to have seven hours in a row of a conference. So thanks very much for for being there still. Um, I think there are two things on enforcement and then maybe I can touch on, on cooperation which are important and just to, to pursue what had just been said on the level of enforcement, which what is the optimal level of enforcement. I really think that when you have global firm or a pan-European firm, you need a centralized enforcement, you know, uh, because the, a, a national regulatory authority will never have, I think, the incentive nor the ability, you were talking about the ability to cooperate, but also there is the ability also to face a, a big firm, but also the incentive to do it. So, to me, um, this lesson was learned 10 years ago with uh, financial supervision, where the biggest bank of Europe has been, uh, are now supervised by the ECB, by the um, single supervision mechanism at the ECB. And now this is a lesson that we learn for, for digital firm with the DSA and the DMA. And I think it's very important, I think, to say that the country of origin, uh, the country of origin principle was invented in the context of you had small firm who wanted to scale up to, to Europe. And that is a very good principle. 
But for very big firms which, which have already scaled up, I think the country of origin principle is a disaster to some extent. So, you know, that leads to a very new role for the European Commission because the European Commission has always been the antitrust authority and the trade authority, but now the uh, Commission is becoming a big regulator in Europe on par with the FTC, you know. So I think it's a, it's a very new role for the Commission in a very difficult time because the budget of the Commission is remain constant or is supposed to decrease. So, you know, we have this paradox that uh, you know, we ask more and more to the Commission to do, and we have seen that also in the vaccine and everything, but no more, uh, no, no, not necessarily more budget. So there is a big issue there that uh, needs to be solved, and uh, uh, the, vice, uh, the Executive Vice President was mentioning that uh, to the great question of Augustine, uh, so she's hoping from the big force, I don't know whether um, her wish will be realized. But if not, which is a, a possible scenario. So if there is not so many people at the European Commission, I think at the end of the day, it's maybe not the biggest issue. So I've read the, the book letters and so on. But to me, what is very important is the mode of enforcement, more than the number of staff. And uh, there, I think what is very important is that the Commission is open, and I think the Commission will be open, but the test will be the procedural regulation that uh, the Commission should adopt um, uh, as the first legal document uh, after the entry into force of the DMA, the procedural regulation, how far the European Commission is ready to partner with everyone uh, to ensure uh, the, um, uh, the enforcement of the DMA and the DSA. And in a way, you know, there I think the Commission can learn a lot from the platform themselves, which, you know, some characterize the platform as an inverted firm, you know, where you ask, in fact, your user to do your job. Uh, and uh, they just collect the money. Um, the, in this case, I think the European Commission could also be a kind of inverted agency, you know, where uh, um, the Commission partner with the regulated firm, the user and the civil society, and Burke will probably uh, play a key role there, and the national authority uh, to, uh, to do its job. So how? Because you could say, ah, yes, partner with a regulated firm, this is the uh, receipt for capture. So of course we have to be careful about regulatory capture, but there are some in, in the DSA and in the DMA around compliance officer, compliance report, uh, risk assessment, protection of whistleblower. So all those um, instruments are there, I think, are the best allies of the Commission within the firm. And so they have to really be taken seriously and in a way, in the process and in the procedures that the Commission will implement, uh, take very seriously. User and um, business user, or end user, consumer and civil society will play a key role. That means that they need to have the right information. So I take the, uh, a, a short example. The uh, gatekeeper will have to produce a compliance report explaining how they comply with the DMA. Very, very good. But, and then they have to produce a summary, a non-confidential summary of this compliance report. No, I mean, if this summary is two pages, it will be completely useless for the, uh, for the business user or for the civil society. So it's very important that this summary is meaningful and can be used uh, by, uh, the, um, by the user to help the Commission to do its job. And finally, the national authority. So we have a representative of a, an extremely good national authority. Those people have some comparative advantage compared to the Commission. You know? They are closer to the field. In some cases, they are more agile. Uh, and so it's very, it's very important that there is a strong partnership. And there again, I mean, I think what we see in uh, financial regulation is very interesting. You know, you have those joint investigation team which are set up uh, between the National um, Financial Supervisory Authority and um, uh, the, uh, the, um, the ECB staff uh, to then do the joint investigation and then the decision is taken at the open level. But the investigation is done jointly uh, at, um, at every level. So I think, I think it's important, and I think, you know, if you want to have this participatory regulation working, you have to have the incentive right, you know. So that means that um, the process that the Commission will set uh, in, in motion should um, increase the benefit, uh, of, uh, the benefit of cooperation and should also uh, increase the cost of obstruction. So that means what? It means that if a company is really, um, you know, uh, cooperative, the Commission should be ready to listen to them if the company is really obstructive. 
very soon, I think the Commission should move to a kind of a non-compliance decision and escalate the process, you know. So I really think that uh, the incentive in the process should be, uh, should be right. No, and finally, in terms of cooperation, I think uh, um, most of the report uh, concluded, as you, as you were saying, that cooperation is extremely important. Cooperation uh, among different authorities within the same country, and, and here I think um, the Netherlands have uh, uh, launched a very interesting experience with this network of, um, of authority. It's not easy because people speak a, a different language. Uh, uh, I, uh, with, uh, with a colleague, uh, we, uh, we steered a digital clearing group for a while, a digital clearing house for a while, which was, you know, a group of privacy regulator, uh, competition authority, uh, consumer protection authority, and it's difficult because, you know, people come from a very different language even. Um, so it's difficult to do at the, at the national level. It will be even more complicated to do at the European level uh, because uh, then you don't have even the same administrative culture. You don't have the same language. Uh, but, but it will be key. And we have now um, a new, um, a new work, work group, if you want, or high-level group in the DMA, huh, which is exactly that, you know, which will regroup um, the network of telecom regulators, the network of antitrust uh, agencies, the network of consumer protection agencies, the network of privacy regulator, and the network of media regulator. So it may become a, a bureaucratic nightmare, and there is a probability that it's that, but it may also become a very useful um, instrument of cooperation across country and across legal field. Now, again, it will be super complicated. And as you say, I mean, people in agency are not necessarily revolutionary, but this is a kind of revolutionary um, tool. And I, I really hope that it will work. Now, how, for instance, by, um, you know, working on some cases, you know, the worst would be, you know, you have those kind of big talk and, you know, you talk generalities and then nothing happened. But um, it, it's very important that this DMA high-level group has a lot of potential uh, but it needs to be it needs to be steer well, and so really, I hope the commission uh, um, will be able to steer this process uh, in a way which, given the the, the, the the constraint of the resource that the commission have, still can deliver um, because you know we i mean nobody can miss this this enforcement you know this is the thing i mean we cannot we cannot uh, be wrong on that. the challenge as it has been said, are very high, and so I really hope it will work but you know, let's have a conference in three years and, and discuss. <laughs> we say that every two years. <laughs> yes, I know, I know. Ursula, there's a lot for you to react to there. Um, so I will let you take it in your own order. Well, thank you very much. And, and thank you for these very detailed and, and interesting insights from the different sectors. So I would like to start at a very basic level. Uh, and maybe with the question, why did we uh, put a panel together to discuss enforcement, right? And you heard Professor Subov saying uh, that she's optimistic about the future because there are so many new discussions all the time popping up. Uh, discussions that we would not have imagined three years ago. And actually, this discussion about enforcement, about the future of enforcement, it is a discussion, and you have heard the Vice President in the morning, it is a discussion about people. It is a discussion about the consumer protection on the ground. It is a discussion about the high level of consumer protection that the European institutions are obliged to provide to European people. But I would dare to say that particularly, or maybe let's talk only about the digital world, we do not have currently a high level of protection. You have heard all the concerns regarding the surveillance, the commercial surveillance in which we live, and that is only going to increase and to exacerbate if we do not finally act against this. And so this is why we wanted to have this discussion to see how we can make the laws deliver on the ground. We see a lot of new enforcement structures currently coming out of the digital regulations. What I think we would push uh, for and what we, if I can say, Birk would maybe like to see on the wish list for the 30th anniversary of the single market, which we will celebrate on 1st of January 2023, is to have a new approach to enforcement and to put it on the table as a big discussion to say what architectures do we have, what governance structures do we have, how do they, they um, uh, relate to a single market single market is 30 years old, but our enforcement structures are still dominated by, of course, the national 
uh, enforcement regimes and it is the competence mainly of the member states. But is that fit for the current situation and for the challenges that we, we see? So I think this is really the reason why we wanted to have this discussion. And um, I am also still very grateful for the EDPS because they started this discussion about enforcement in the digital world in June with a huge conference. And this is, of course, not comparable, this little panel that we have here, but the topic is consumer protection and the enforcement that is necessary. And I know, I see the European Commission is, of course, also um, uh, here, not only DG Comp, but also DG Justice in the audience. The consumer agenda uh, from 2020 has as a priority enforcement uh, and there is a very interesting enforcement package coming up, hopefully, next year. Uh, but, of course, it is not only about consumer authorities, because this is also about GDPR enforcement that is at the very center of protecting consumers when it comes to commercial surveillance. It's also about competition enforcement. It's also about all these new structures that we are currently creating, which is the Digital Services Act, the DMA that you talked about. It's about the Future AI Act. It's about the Data Act. It's about everything. We do not have this discussion about how does the big picture look. So I would like to see in the next European Commission a unit a directorate, a DG, dedicated to looking at the different enforcement elements. And four years ago, I would not have thought that we would have a DSA that gives exclusive powers to the European Commission to enforce the DSA against the very big online platforms. But it has happened very quickly. But I think we have not yet discussed enough what is the next step and what are the next questions. So in terms of questions, and I think Dries in particular raised uh, a few of the challenges that I would like to mention. So we have this question about centralization of enforcement. What are the cases, what are the scenarios, what are the laws where we need to give more powers to who? To the European Commission? To another centralized body? To a new institution? So who is going to be that independent body that we need to overlook um, um, cases that require a European intervention because otherwise enforcement is not effective and this is what we suffer from as consumers. There is not so much effective enforcement. We need interdisciplinarity, we have seen that and I'm going to give you another example hopefully um, still in this panel. So enforcement networks, enforcement authorities have to work together. Everything is related in the data economy to data processing, a lot at least, personal data, and everything comes with a competition angle, so these networks need to work together. And most importantly, of course, now increasingly, the funding aspects. If you give powers to the Commission and the Commission doesn't have the money to do the job, this will not look good and it will not do what we all expect it to do. We know that the EDPB has taken on new challenges with looking after strategic cases, but EDPB doesn't have enough budget. EDPS is having increasingly very important tasks, but they do not have enough budget. So we need these institutions to deliver, and we need to, these institutions to end commercial surveillance. We will not be able to do it unless we have the democratically legitimized institutions who can do it. Um, there is a lot of other points uh, to say on that, but I think at the same time we should think about consumer organizations and what they do in private enforcement. And just for those um, who know about the Representative Action Directive, which finally <coughs> was adopted last year, which would give collective redress powers, um, well, two people in the sense of consumer organizations can represent them. The member states are now in this very weeks uh, implementing these direct, this directive into national laws and that will be fundamentally important because there's so much discretion that the member states ha have whether this will be effective or not. So it's really in these weeks that this is happening and we will see whether private enforcement and consumers uh, and their organizations can play a major role here too. So strong European solutions, I think this is what we really need to discuss and also integrated enforcement in various ways, but certainly also how can private and public 
enforcement structures come together? How can consumer organizations also contribute to that? So that was my introduction. Well, I know it's nearly five o'clock, so I'm going to take the pressure off the audience by not asking you to ask questions. Instead, I'm going to ask you to answer one. <laughs> um, a show of hands, I'm sure everyone needs a stretch. Uh, so, Ventislav mentioned something I thought was interesting, which is about a couple of times you said an enforcement culture or a culture of enforcement. And you seem to imply that the, the DPA has got a boost through the GDPR. So what I'm interested to know is whether you think, the audience thinks in general, with the raft of new digital laws, I mean DMA, DSA, DGA, Data Act, AI Act, all of these put together could have a energizing or a boosting effect on enforcement culture in Europe, or whether it will be business as usual, lack of resources, lack of human resources, lack of funding. Those who are on the more optimistic side, let's see your hands. <laughs> and those who see the glass more half empty. <laughs> almost 50-50, maybe more pessimism than optimism. So. Um, that, that, that's, you know, you've split a room here on, on the panel. So uh, let me, and Alberto, ask you, you know, other than price, we talk about price as, as one of the big distinguishing factors. Um, what are the other effects that we need to be taking into account? Many. And in fact, price in the digital world, much more than in the offline world, is is not really the principal factor, or not always the principal factor. We know, you know very well how many things we get for free, um, uh, price-wise, from, from the digital world. And I think you, you're all aware that actually they're not for free. And I think the sticker in the package is, uh, is the perfect uh, you know, a simplification of that. There is no such thing of a free app. Uh, so what are the effects? But data, obviously, is the big price with, uh, uh, with which people pay for the services they receive. This is an important dimension that it's quite new uh, for us to consider what, how data matters. It's easy to, 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 to figure out, but what value to give to data is more complicated, I must say, in a competition analysis. Also because we think grappling, you know, if you ask people, um, is data, is your data privacy important to you? I think the vast majority says yes, but then uh, you ask people, are you happy to click twice and spend uh, half a second actually affirming your right that your data privacy is important? Then people talk with their feet and they are all very annoyed and they tend to agree to all uh, b b because they just, it just goes faster. So data is a very important element. Then there are other dimensions that are very important for um, assessing the impact on competition and on, uh, on fair competition of, um, of the big tech uh, practices. Choice is very important. Are, are we effectively given a choice? There is a huge rhetoric that we are actually provided with choice as we have never been before. Is it really true when we are actually uh, completely directed towards an ecosystem where uh, there is a lot of internal coherence, a lot of beauty sometimes as well, but effectively we have not really a choice. And we know that it is in their power to, to choose what works and what doesn't work within an ecosystem. And another dimension that is probably even more important is innovation. What what is the impact of certain practices on innovation. Um, we have beautiful products because there has been many people who had beautiful ideas and they were, you know, they were able to put them in practice. Are we still in the same environment? Is a brilliant idea, can a brilliant today, a brilliant idea, does it have a fair chance to make it to the public and to actually to benefit consumers? There, I'm afraid, I'm a bit pessimistic in the digital world. When I hear that, you know, we, we shouldn't be tough on acquisition from big tech to potential innovators because that's the only exit uh, strategy that a potential innovator has is to be bought by a big company. That I find really scary because when the potential innovate, when the big tech buys the, um, 
the clever new gadgets and they put in, in their ecosystem, there are another 10 or 20 other innovators that were also trying to get there, and they are dead. The moment that big tech steps in, there is no finance, there is no appetite for those anymore. And, and so, so these are all dimensions that are very, very important to us. Not all are completely new. Um, it's um, the, our analysis of innovation and of choice it's also in the, let's say, in the old style economy. We have done it. We've done it in chemicals, in agro, in the agro business. We've done it a lot in pharma. But again, the scale of the problem in the, in the digital world is much more enhanced and we need to pay a lot of attention to it. Well, I know I'm not really supposed to give my opinion as a moderator, but I would appeal for a new definition of innovation because finding cleverer, faster ways to sell me stuff I don't need and can't afford isn't really innovation. It's not the steam engine, the internet, graphene or blockchain or something. So, you know, innovation is, should be blue sky thinking. It's, that's the sort of innovation we want, not just tweaking the edges so some companies can make more money. Uh, that's, that's take my hat off again now. <laughs> um, I agree. <laughs> Venceslav, let me, let me come to you um, and ask you a question about, because um, Alexander mentions the mode of enforcement. And I'm wondering, um, obviously there's powers to enforce changes on the way businesses do their business, but then there's also sanctions. And I know the GDPR gave, uh, gave DPAs a big sanctions uh, stick to beat companies with. Do you think there should be one more emphasis on one or the other? Uh, first of all, um, I'm not against innovations and uh, digital services, etc. That uh, uh, the reason for developing of this business is to help us as uh, citizens. And you can see in the last two years, uh, uh, digital um, purchases and deliveries increased significantly and they save us because of the uh, situation with COVID and the, uh, our inability to move, etc. The thing here is that they have to be regulated in a way to serve us better uh, and to receive uh, um, uh, um, uh, actually the, the added value of, of these services. Uh, here, uh, I would say if we want um, effective enforcement, that's why I, I, I told you that from my perspective, uh, for a person uh, working into this area of uh, data protection, where the situation is already regulated because of the um, uh, because of the general data protection regulation. Um, uh, it is that we have now strong institutions, which does not exist in the consumer uh, area, but in addition to strong institutions, we need the credible institutions which people trust. And uh, here is, uh, in the room, I would say, very positive that half of the room is um, uh, positive and the other is uh, on the principle of uh, the glass is uh, not full enough uh, in order to drink. But um, I will tell you that in 2016, when we asked this question on the information campaigns for the uh, GDPR, it was maybe one or two people in the room which are and were experts in the field that were optimistic for the GDPR to happen and uh, for its implementation. Uh, well, I, I don't want to say that th there are no problems with the implementation of the GDPR, uh, but uh, there are ways to resolve this. And I will say that, uh, first of all, in order to be successful and next time uh, two-thirds of the room to be very positive, we, we would need a fast procedure to remedy the infringed consumer's rights. Uh, it is the same into the data protection. The problem is that we implement a direct, uh, not directive, um, a regulation which gives us a, a, a strong capacity, which gives us some uh, certain rules and time frame, but we implement it on our, our local, at national level, uh, procedural administrative law, which is very complicated, which requires for us not only to give uh, the right to the parties to hear them uh, about the complainant and, uh, uh, and uh, the controller, for example, uh, what he has done and how they process the data, uh, but also requires us to collect all possible facts and clarify all possible um, circumstances in the procedure to objectively respond in this case. 
And it's very complicated on timing to do it. And so the procedure becomes very long. And the um, co uh, consumer, the complainant in this case, uh, and in our case, the data subject is not satisfied because the remedy of his rights or her rights or their rights, if we want to be inclusive, uh, is too long. Yeah, and they don't feel it as they are remedied. They feel that the body, the state body, that is the authority of data uh, protection, for example, um, is losing their time, is losing uh, public money, they are not competent, and etc., etc., which is not the case. But at the end, this is the perception. This we have to overtake. And if we want uh, enforcement authorities to work together, it cannot happen uh, just because they are established as a consumer enforcement authorities. They have to meet together. They have to become a team. The, uh, the uh, data protection um, um, regulation on, uh, that is the GDPR, I would say, uh, actually established the framework where the authorities meet. There are certain exchanges, opinions, uh, subgroups on experts. This is the way how it can happen. Otherwise, it is not possible. Exchanging of emails, um, uh, phone calls, uh, uh, they have to um, identify the problems on a daily basis. In a certain cases, they have to develop the uh, guidelines themselves, the experts have to work on them to understand uh, that um, if there is a cross-border uh, situation, there would be the people that will be confronted with the resolving of that situation. Ursula, what we're hearing there is something you're familiar with, the, the, the long, complicated road to redress. And tell us a bit, I mean, are the, the barriers to getting redress too high for the average citizen? I mean, we talked about you know, collective action and so on. Um, what do you want to see? What would make it better uh, from an enforcement point of view, from the individual? Well, I wanted to tell a story about a case that we, uh, that we took together with our members uh, last year. And uh, it's, it's a case that is uh, not really a GDPR complaint, but I just wanted to say to Ventislav, we have a case pending with our members, our members who brought complaints, GDPR complaints. Uh, against uh, Google's location uh, data tracking, which I think is a fundamental case for what we suffer from, from the commercial surveillance situation. Mm -hmm. So I think it would be a very important case. We brought it, our members brought it in 2018, mm -hmm. and we still don't have the decision. And this is not because of procedures that are too complicated. It is because of the country of origin principle, and which gives so much responsibility to a specific country, to a specific uh, data protection uh, agency. And, and we suffer from, from that, I think, in the first instance. But I know there has been much more uh, progress in the, in the last uh, year, at least. And so we hope that this is going to be addressed too. But I mean, four years for a fundamentally important complaint by data subjects in several countries, and there is no response. That's not a very good mark for the GBPR, if I, if I can say so. But I wanted to very briefly talk about another case, which is under the CBC, so the Consumer Protection Network. Uh, we, as BIO, together with our member, we can alert authorities about uh, infringements. And uh, we took a case against TikTok for various infringements, not only consumer law infringements, uh, which we found with regards to unfair terms of service, with regards to their virtual item policy where people buy something for their stars uh, that they admire on TikTok that is uh, then turned into something which is not a monetary recognition, but is something like, uh, well, a virtual item. Uh, we found uh, hidden and misleading advertising, advertising directed to children, which was not um, transparent. We also found uh, potentially harmful content, and this would not then go to the CPC network, but to the authorities in charge of the audiovisual media services directive. So we had three elements. We had GDPR problems, we had consumer law problems, we had audiovisual, so content 
problems, right? And we addressed it to the CPC network. We addressed it not as a complaint, but we addressed it to the EDPB as a report. And we went uh, to ERGA, ERGA, which is the Network for Audiovisual Services um, uh, Directive, and they don't even have a network that has any formal functions, though it's a hugely important uh, sector for, of course, the uh, digital uh, world as well. And just to say, one and a half, le uh, half years later, the results are as follows. So we have a decision of the CPC, uh, and I have to say the CPC has improved a lot in terms of has been modernized two years ago and has, I think, made a lot of progress and a lot of uh, good things happening. But we also see now the limits uh, of that network and that cooperation. This is why it's great that there is um, a new um, uh, package coming up. Um, so we have seen a decision there after one and a half years. Uh, which was commitments by TikTok. These commitments are partially good. It's all about transparency in the first instance that is going to be improved so consumers understand what they see on TikTok, if it's advertising or not. But there are also other important points that have not been addressed. Uh, one of the most important uh, points that has not been significantly addressed in terms of solutions is how people give consent uh, to the data processing. And there we are in a borderline between consumer law and data protection law, and there was no cooperation with the EDPB or with the respective data protection authorities. So that is a fundamental problem. Uh, the EDPB responded that they have a task force, that it's the Irish again, because TikTok, of course, is based in Ireland, uh, and that uh, the DPC, the Irish authorities, looking into uh, their own volition inquiry, which may cover some of the concerns that we raised, may cover not, so we are still waiting to see what comes out of that. And then ERGA, the Network of Audiovisual Services um, um, Content Authorities, they said, well, it's Ireland, because TikTok is based in Ireland, country of origin principle. Then we went to Ireland, and that authority, the broadcasting authority, said, sorry, but we did not implement yet the last revision of the Audiovisual Services Media Directive, which has an obligation on the member states to ensure that content of uh, video platforms must not harm the development of minors, etc., etc. Ireland said, sorry, not implemented. Uh, and by the way, we are not the authority because it's going to be the new authority that is foreseen in the legal draft that is not yet through the parliament. So that was one and a half years ago. So there was nothing we could do. And Erga said, we will discuss it, but so this is the reality of how consumers are protected in Europe today. And I don't think it is good enough. Uh, I just wanted to give it as an example of what the challenges are. Thank you. Don't say jurisdiction shopping. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, we're almost at the end of, of our day. So I'm going to ask just a final question uh, to Alexandra and Rhys which is to identify one action point, if you could wave a magic wand that you would like to see that would create better enforcement or better cooperation between enforcement agencies and, and, and what, you would, you know, what you think might be a good lever. Alexandra, I'll let you go first. So, I mean, one thing is we are already on the way is centralization. I, I agree. I mean, this, this, those examples are very telling. And I think now the legislator have understand, have understood the problem with the DSA, the DMA is very clear. So the question, I think, is uh, how the Commission will be up to this task. And as I said, for me, there is two things which are absolutely key, is that the culture of the Commission change and, and they become a kind of a geek uh, authority. So they understand exactly what is happening. And, and, and it's very complicated. You know, I think changing law, and this is why, I mean, all those new law at, at your question, I think the real issue is how the culture is changing, you know? um, not so much the law. And so um, um, a geek culture, and I, I don't know how the interaction between uh, the, the technologists, which will be higher in the commission, and um, the other part of the case team will be done. I think a lot can be learned from how the economists have been integrated into the analysis in Digicom, which was a success. So uh, ideally, the, this success will be replicated. And then the other thing which I think is important is technological enforcement. So how technology can help the enforcement. Um, over lunch, we were joking uh, with um, Wolfgang Kerber about uh, uh, the EU is giving a lot of money for innovation uh, uh, on AI, but uh, very little money to regulate uh, the digital society. And maybe it's as in, in an order liberal perspective, as he was reminding me, uh, rule as, as important for innovation than, than, than firm. 
But, you know, one thing is maybe the Commission should apply to their own program, you know, to develop AI tool uh, to, to better uh, um, do their job. You know? So I think the, this technological enforcement, the use of digital technology to help enforcement is absolutely key as well. Okay. Luis, final word. Yes, thanks. So maybe just before I answer your question, very briefly back to you, Ursula, and the TikTok case. I think it's an interesting case. We, we have spoken about it off record. Um, the, one, the only one thing I want to point out, though, that you say it was all transparency. It, a lot of it was indeed. <clears throat> the interesting thing, though, is that, as we discussed this morning, a lot of people have introduced the idea of re reversing the burden of proof. This is actually the first time we actually did. So we said to TikTok, you need to be more transparent, but we also want you to measure how transparent you are and you're going to report back to us. So I think that's an important thing that I just wanted to highlight. Um, in terms of improving cooperation, I think there's, there's two points basically to mention. I think to a certain degree, we, I, I agree with Alexander that we need to talk about centralization of some powers. Um, be it at the European Commission or any other enforcement body. I think we need to be aware of that probably within the consumer protection realm, this is probably a little harder to do as it's probably of the three, the least harmonized field. So in terms of the norms. So that, that could be a thing, there is, there is history, there's a long hit tradition in most countries uh, in relation to consumer protection, and sometimes it diverges. So th that is something we, we, I think, need to take into account, but I think it is definitely a, a way forward and it will respond to some of the problems that we currently see. I think the other thing is if we talk about inter-network cooperation, um, I'm not a great fan of setting up <coughs> big and heavy structures. I think what we, what we really need to do as network is identify the overarching um, topics that we have in common that we prioritize and then really start looking into very specific cases on which we can cooperate and I am a big believer of you know the system will grow with us um, and it will show itself to us as soon as we start doing this so I really believe in hands-on cooperation um, as quickly as possible with a the system following that well thank you all very much big round of applause for our final panel please <laughs>